I showed this guitarist in my band this video as he loves to shred way too much and he will not say anything to me. Goes to show how some people love their ego too much. LOL. I think a lot of us know somebody exactly like that. He's usually playing lead guitar somewhere. Hey everybody, it's Friday. I hope you're gonna have an amazing weekend. It's time for SMG Viewers Comments, episode number 338. The show, that is about you, not about me. So let's skip the bullshit and get right to the questions. Just play Christian rock. You have a better chance. Rip off a band like Stained or Green Day and sing about how Jesus is sad and you'll make millions. You're referencing the video there I did a while back, 13 Reasons Why Your Band Will Never Make It. That's absolutely a wonderful winning strategy. You've got a built-in audience. And believe me, if I didn't have a conscience, I'd be doing exactly that. But I just there's just no way I could sing like that and then look myself in the mirror every day. I just, I just couldn't do it. I'm not wired that way. But for those of you guys who don't mind exploiting the gullible for profit, hey, have at it because there is a giant market for that shit. Holy shit, we sold a million records. Praise the Lord! It's a miracle! Thinking I would absolutely make it if I try hard enough actually screwed up my life quite a bit. I was dumb enough to sacrifice a pretty solid career to have more time to learn to play the instrument and mix my music over the last 12 years. Should have listened to those with more experience in the matter who told me a career in music is a difficult path. These days, I think a career in anything is a difficult path. I mean, like, if you're working a shit retail job right now, you know, you've got to worry about a fucking pandemic. That's pretty fucking difficult. I don't see it being any more difficult than trying to make a living out of music. Here's the thing. If you want to play music for a living, go fucking play music. Just fucking do it. You only get one shot at life. You got to ask yourself, what's your priority? Making a bunch of money or playing music? Ask yourself what do you want to do with your very limited time on earth? Do you want to spend your time working your ass off so somebody else can get rich? Or do you want to take a shot for yourself? A lot of you people are going, no, that's terrible advice. And th there probably is some truth to that. You're probably going to wind up living in poverty and starving. Not to mention, even if you do make it, you might still wind up broke. It certainly happened to Chuck Berry and him and a million other rock stars along the way. Music is not an easy career. But I'm going to put this question to everybody watching the show. What do you really enjoy doing with your life? Ask yourself that. The speaker swap makes a big difference, but the cabinet itself is as much important as well. Buying a cheap cabinet and using nice speakers won't do the trick alone. You would be even more surprised if you were to put those nasty Jensen's in a nice cabinet, how much that makes a difference as well. Wrong, Luca! Okay, you're referencing the video we just put out on Tuesday where we upgraded the world's worst guitar cabinet. Here's the thing, I thought exactly the same as you, and even though I wound up getting one of the best mixes of my career, I thought, okay, can I still make this better? What would happen if I took those awesome speakers and put them into a really great cab? So I actually pulled them out of that Behringer cab and dropped them into my coffee custom cab, which easily costs 10 times as much as that Behringer cabinet does. It's beautiful, handmade in the Czech Republic. It's just absolutely gorgeous. I featured it on the show a few years ago. And I thought, okay, let's drop these in. It's gonna sound even better, but it didn't. And I'm gonna do a follow-up episode on that. So in this case, the shit cabinet with great speakers had something very unique about it and allowed me to get one of the best fucking mixes of my career. So in this case, dropping more money into a cabinet might not be the best option. And just to verify that, I sent the two mixes out to some friends of mine, some people with ears I really trust, and every single one of them picked the mix with the Behringer. I'm just gonna do a quick follow-up video on that next week, where I'll shoot the two out and show off the different cabinets, and I'll let you guys decide which sounds better, but I'm not gonna tell you which cabinets which. That way you have to listen with your ears and not your eyes, like so many of you love doing. That Neil Creamback Grindstein mix is probably one of the best metal mixes I've ever heard. Hey Yeti Maximus, thank you so much. That really does mean the world to me. Uh, we did that mix with a combination of the Rev Generator 3 using uh, the Purple Channel for two of the tracks, and then we used it on the Clean Channel in combination with this, the Clerton Grindstein from Cola Keller Studios. This thing's like an HM2 on Ultra Hyper Steroids. It's absolutely amazing. And that was going into that crappy Behringer cabinet with the Celestian Neo Creambacks with the 57 and a Toll G12 microphone. And we got this.
Now, for you guys who are curious about how I managed to get that sound, I dropped a grand total of 100 Canadian dollars on the worst guitar cabinet on earth and upgraded it with some brand new Celestion speakers. It put the guitars into a certain frequency that allowed me to hear the drums better, and I was able to remix the drums from the ground up and just get this amazingly crushing mix. So it's all a combination of a bunch of things. If you didn't see that video, I'd highly recommend it. I'll have a link in the cards, wherever the hell they are, and I'll have a link for that video at the end, as well as in the description below. I'd highly recommend checking that out because you can get some truly astounding guitar sounds for not a whole lot of money. If you're looking for a new cab, you might want to think about trying this route because you can save yourself a fucking fortune. Holy fuck! I've been having fun swapping out pickups and other odds and ends on found pawn shop guitars lately, but I'm gonna 100% bring home a 4x12 and start a new project for 2022. Thanks, Glenn, for doing the work to test all the preconceived BS in the metal and greater musical community. I've been aware of so many fallacies that have been held as lost stemming back all the way to the 80s and 90s. This was educational and very entertaining. Well, thanks, dude. I mean, that's the thing. We all grew up reading a bunch of stuff in guitar mags and believing it without anybody actually providing any evidence whatsoever. What actually happens? What's going on here? And the more and more I dive into this stuff, I'm realizing the sound is not in the hands, it's not in the tubes, and it's not in the tone wood, it's in the fucking speaker, the pickups, and the microphones. That's where the tone truly is. And I'm going to do a follow-up video on that if I can get permission to use these tracks. I want to show you one of my favorite rhythm tones and how I absolutely cannot replicate that tone in my studio with the tools I have available. Because the sound is not in the fingers, it's in the fucking gear. The final proof that guitarists don't actually care about tone is how little discussion there is around the intricacies of cabs and speakers. Tone chasers, to me, seem more interested in having expensive slash rare gear for bragging rights. And when it actually is about the tone, too many players get hung up on nonsensical snake oil. I'm going to explode if one more person tells you about removing the pick guard and made their guitar sound better, or sanding off the finish, or buying a thousand dollar cable. You'll be a lot better off spending that time and money getting better speakers, cab, or recording gear in general. Now, for my money, it would be getting a cab doesn't even have to be all that expensive. Again, I'm going to follow that up next week. And trying out some various types of speakers. I'd highly recommend anything but the Celestian Vintage 30 because it's fucking done to death. There's a multitude of different speaker options out there. Somebody mentioned the EV Black Labels. I, I want to check those out. The Scumbags, the new Eminence, DV77s, the Webers. There's just all kinds of stuff I want to look into this year. Let's not forget the brand new set of Empyreans that I've shot a video for a couple years ago that hopefully we're finally going to get to release this year. Amazing speakers. Nobody's actually heard them yet because they haven't been released to the public. I've just been sitting on them like, hey guys, are we going to put this out yet or what? You know, the metal community needs this. And it's so cool to be able to get to try these out before anybody else. Like I said, it's a really cool tone. It's very unique. And I think a lot of you guys are going to like what Empyrean has to offer. Stay tuned for that as well. Speakers, folks, that's where the sound really is. Take it from someone who is a cork-sniffing idiot, yours truly, who was told that you have to buy the SED Wing C's New Old Stock and New Old Stock RCA Western Electric, etc. Preamp tubes if you want the best tone. After spending a bloody fortune on tubes, I was so excited to plug them in and have this amazing full killer tone. After realizing that half of these tubes are just old junk that burned out after a couple weeks, oh, how I love playing the Guess Which Tube is Bad game, it didn't take long to realize I made a huge and very costly mistake. Not long after, I got sick of always working on my to swap tubes and just, just shoved in some reasonably priced JJ's. And you know what? JJ's are absolutely fine. They're great. They do the job. And if somebody complains, oh, they're too bright, they're too brittle, they're too classy, they're too blah, blah, fucking blah, ask them this very simple question. Did you try changing your speaker out for something other than what you have in right now? This is not fucking difficult, people. Hey, those Jensen's have character. <laughs> yes, and that character is Pigpen from the Peanuts Gang. Probably one of the most underrated cab speakers of the little Boga Mr. Hector cab. It was a 3x12 configuration with two V30 on the bottom and one Electro Voice black label centered on the top rope. Great live sound and combining both speakers and recording is killer for metal tone. Fidget 30 with a black label. I really want to check those speakers out. I think that's Zach Wilde's signature speaker. Actually, Zach Wilde got one of my favorite guitar tones ever on Ozzy's uh, No More Tears, like the, the title track. Those guitars are just sounding huge. And those were Celestian T75s, the uh, one speaker that everybody hates. Going to be investigating an older set of those as well. See what kind of tones we can get out of that. Going to be very cool. But maybe I'll hit up La Boga. Maybe they'd be interested in seeing one of those cabs on the show. I'm certainly interested to hear it, especially if it's a 3x12. I don't think I've ever come across one of those. Sounds like you're a pop engineer. You're very anti-metal for a metal producer. Well, hey, Carl, uh, here's a clue. Most of the best metal songs are still pop songs at their core. They have verses, they have choruses, they've got hooks, and they've got very memorable melody lines. That's why you can listen to a song like Breaking the Law, Living After Midnight, Panama, or a myriad of others and instantly remember that fucking song because they're fucking memorable. They're not just a bunch of boring fucking riff salad. 
Here's an interesting point. Uh, when we were tracking drums on the second Woods album, we were doing Summer's Envy, and I said that to Dave I, after they got done finished, you know, the bed tracks. I'm like, am I hearing a bit of pop in that? And if you listen to that track, that is essentially a black metal pop song because it has hooks and memorable melodies, that kind of stuff. It just had the core elements. It's all about how it's presented and the attitude. That's what makes it metal. It's not just, you know, mindless chugging on an open eighth string. That shit's just fucking boring. You suck at marketing. Holy fuck, isn't that the truth? I'm awful at that myself. I made a social media presence, but as far as learning how to properly manipulate the algorithms, I don't know where to begin. And the shittiest part is marketing is the absolute most important thing when it comes to music. You can write an amazing song with amazing production, great vocals, great riffs, heavy drums and bass, and a super catchy chorus. It won't mean dick if you don't know how to market yourself. Hey, everybody, this deep voice guy. He's been on the show a couple of times. Great fucking vocalist. No question about that. But he's got a good point. And of course, he's referencing the video 13 Reasons Why Your Band's Never Going to Make It. And the whole marketing thing is definitely one very important aspect. Now, if you want to get better at marketing your band, I'm sure there are tons of master classes about that sort of thing online. And if there isn't, I think that's something we should probably do on Spectre Digital, to be honest with you. But it's really not that fucking hard. Just make sure you get your music out onto the various platforms and push it. Just have fucking interesting content, but more importantly, be very engaging and entertaining. A lot of that comes down to thumbnails, especially in the YouTube game. That's what you're competing against. Uh, you need to have an interesting thumbnail. People are gonna want, need a reason to click on your stuff. But to Deep Voice Guy, the question I'd ask you is, if you're gonna put yourself online, would you click on this? Ask your friends that as well. You might be surprised by the answers you get. Glenn, is it a good idea to use a licensed trademark as your band artist name? My friend is calling himself sub Zero or another Mortal Kombat character, he doesn't realize that if he gets any traction as an artist, he is open to being sued by Midway. Can you use trademark as your band name? Well, Sub Zero is a little bit different because Sub Zero is a scientific phrase and he can use that as a legal defense. I mean, like, if you're going to name your band Coke or Pepsi, you're going to be in for a world of fucking hurt because those companies defend their trademark vigorously and it's much easier because it's a unique name. You name yourself after something scientific that also happens to be a character in a video game, that might be a little bit different. If you call your band Uranium or something like that or Plutonium. 13. You know, that's an actual thing that appears on the periodic table of the elements. That'd be much easier to defend. It's not saying you're not going to get sued, and it's not saying that lawsuits don't cost money, and a company might fucking sue you into oblivion, and the legal fees will sink you even if you have something defensible, but you would be able to defend that in a court. Just, it's going to cost you an awful lot. So ask yourself this, is the juice worth the squeeze. Amazing all fingers point right back to the source. Who would have thought to think all the excuses we hear that blame everything and everyone else but the responsible. <laughs> I don't understand why my band's not making it. Did you try looking in the mirror? My clean vocals sound like absolute garbage. I never use autotune, zero cupping, and I've tried cleans, but they're absolutely terrible. Trevor, you need to go check out Chris Lipe's channel. I got a chance to hang out with Chris there a couple years back. Amazing dude, amazing vocalist, and he can probably give you exactly the help you need. For those of you guys who aren't aware, I'm doing uh, Monday live streams in the morning and sometimes the evening, both on the same day so I can get Europeans and West Coast Americans and all that kind of stuff, where I'm doing mixed reviews and I'm noticing that at least half the songs, the people doing vocals need singing lessons. So I will say this, uh, Chris and I are gonna team up and make a special offer to the viewers of Spectre Sound and uh, give you guys some really cool vocal lessons. And I think you're gonna like what's gonna be offered and it's gonna be at a special discount just for this audience, which I think is pretty fucking amazing. Like I said, Chris is an absolute monster vocalist. I'll have a link to his channel in this video's description. I'd highly recommend heading on over to Chris's channel and subscribing because he's gonna teach you some awesome stuff. A very recent, very upsetting phenomenon we're seeing is the ridiculous rising of prices, especially on Reverb. I was shocked to see stuff like 6505 Plus and Marshall Valste 8100s in poor conditions, I might add, going respectively for 1200 and 600 euros. How people suddenly feel entitled to shoot these prices through the roof for no reason is beyond me. Any thoughts on that? Cheers from Rome. Well, cheers from Canada. Rome is definitely a city I would love to visit one day. Hopefully that's going to happen this year with any luck. Anyway, as per your question, I remember I paid $600 Canadian for my 5150 head I bought in back in 2005. And then I uh, had the chance to buy another one a couple of years later for about the same price, maybe a little bit more. And that's the crazy thing. The price has risen enough. I was actually able to sell my first 5150 and that covered the cost of both amps. So that's absolutely nuts. I understand the phenomenon. It's called supply and demand. Everybody's at home. Everybody's playing music. So people feel they can raise the prices up on their various instruments and they're getting those prices. So it really 
comes down to what the market is willing to pay for. If you find that the first generation 5150 is being priced out of reach, maybe look for a first generation Axe effects because the price on those has probably come down quite a bit as opposed to what they used to charge for the brand new ones. And those can sound pretty fucking amazing and have quite a breadth of available tones on them. That and just some of the software stuff. If you're sitting and recording at home, some of the desktop amp sims are just absolutely outstanding these days and you really can't go wrong with them. Especially if you're recording because they're gonna give you great sounds right out of the box with minimal dicking around. Hey, Geezer Butler recorded his first Black Sabbath album with a 4x10 bass cabinet that only had three working speakers. Do you think that unintentionally gave him an advantage in any way? No, I think the thing that gave Geezer Butler his advantage was his amazing skill at playing the bass guitar. And he could probably get everything he needed out of that rig, even with a broken fucking speaker. I had the opportunity to mix Tony Franklin there a couple years back, and it was the easiest thing I've ever had to do. All I had to do was put up the fader because the guy was absolutely flawless. When you're working with musicians at that level, they know how to get the best they possibly can out of their equipment, even if it is broken. But for the rest of us, show up with gear that works to the fucking studio, please. Glenn, do you have a preference on mic pre's when tracking heavy guitars, API, Neve, etc.? Thanks, brother. Ah, uh, well, the 1073 OPX from Neve is probably what gets used the most in the studio these days. I've got some APIs back there. I've got some Cranborns. But dude, yeah, it's not your preamps holding you back. It's probably your mic technique and your speakers and your cabinet. Work on that first. Maybe try a couple different speakers in your cabinet. Find out what's going to give you a great sound. And move the mic around a little bit. You'd be surprised at the results you get. Take a lot of notes as well. I'll say it before and I'll say it again. Making your art, whether that's music or anything else, look and sound exactly like everyone else's is not how you compete. Someone out there is already doing it better than you, especially in a lot of modern metal where you're already filling up basically every frequency to the point where there's very little room for variation in the first place. You compete by offering your audience something they can't literally get anywhere else. And to do that, you have to do something different. Uh, that's 100% right on the fucking money. If you're making music, if you're a photographer, or if you're a YouTube host, yes, you have to do something different than everybody else. In my case, it's you know, just turn off the filters and say what's really on my mind. The world needs a lesson on better band photos for sure. Please do it, Glenn. If I never see a band photo on train tracks or in front of a brick wall again, I'll be so happy. Maybe it's a pet peeve of mine, but I hate when the band has their instruments in their hands too. The poor drummer just has to hold a couple of sticks so that people won't mistake him for a lowly vocalist. Yeah, I'm gonna start working on that tomorrow. I think I'm gonna start scripting that one out as how to take better band photos because from what I've seen, you guys really need that fucking video. Don't get me wrong. There's a million photographers out there better than me, but for all you guys to say about my, my mixing, oh, who's he ever done? And who's he ever done? Well, uh, in photography, I shot for Chrysler. So I do have that as a professional credit. So I might have an idea of what the fuck I'm talking about when it comes to photography. Hopefully I can help some of you guys out and help you get some better ideas for creating a mood and atmosphere and making your band stand out just a little bit more than the next band. So make sure you're subscribed and hit the notification bell so you get word when that video comes out. I'm aiming for Tuesday, it might be Wednesday. Who knows how difficult that one's gonna be to make. Remains to be seen, but it should be an awful lot of fun. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. If you've got a comment, you got a question, or there's just something that's burning in your mind about recording, please leave it in the comments below because I try and read every single one of them. And if it's cool, I'll be more than happy to put it on the show. So until next time, I leave you with this. Remember that life is short. Make sure you're spending a good part of that doing what you want to do with your life. Hey everybody, it's Friday morning. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Try that one more time. Sorry. No, we'll do that one more time. That's tough. God damn it, one more time. God damn it, this one's tough. Huh. Ugh. How about it? Because those guys. <laughs> That's gonna get somebody's attention. <laughs> so until next. Clerton, is that how we fucking pronounce this?